Duh in the Foyer, a commentary on Malachi. Introduction Malachi was a Mr. In-Between. His message surfaced during the absence of Nehemiah when he returned to Persia 432 to 425 BC, as well as between the Old and New Testaments. When Nehemiah returned after a seven-year absence, he discovered the prophet's message. Ninety-four years had passed since Rubabel and the first wave of returnees arrived to re-establish the nation following the Babylonian captivity. In that nearly one hundred year time frame, national life was re-established. The temple was rebuilt, a semi-revival had taken place under Ezra, and the wall around Jerusalem was finished. Also in that period, there was a denigration of true and faithful worship. One might associate the 100-year celebration of Azusa Street and the current conflux. The move from a freshly liberated people who were grateful for their release to an arrogant citizenry with an equally arrogant priesthood was no small turn. Sent to this scene was Malachi, my messenger, the prophet. Imagine a people having experienced the blessing of God for almost a hundred years, celebrating that event by the following responses. In what way have you loved us? 1 verse 2, speaking to God. Wherein have we despised you? 1 verse 7, expressing this not once, but three times. Despise, Old Testament, Baza, to disesteem, considered a vile person. What way have we defiled you? 1 verse 7 Used two times and is the same word as despised. For what reason? 2 verse 14 Uttered when the Lord said he would not accept their offerings. In what way have we wearied him? 2 verse 17 Old Testament wearied, yaga, to be exhausted. Where is the God of justice? 2 verse 17 spiritual determination in what way shall we return 3 verse 7 and what way have we robbed you 3 verse 8 what have we spoken against you 3 verse 13 such questions in reality they were actually answers served as an affront to God in the same manner as a wayward child's remonstration upon being corrected or shown error. Can one not hear Israel's real heart in these questions? When reviewed as a whole, they stand as a signal of the national spiritual state. Would these examples not serve to signal the same today? Let a Malachi enter a word or Bible church with probing exactness and one would observe the same pouting arrogance. Allow God to hurl the following invective into that congregation and observe the result. This church is not true to the word. Immediately would come forth, in what way? How can you say that? What right do you have to make such an observation? Without a moment's hesitation, there would be a wholesale rebuke of the messenger and ultimately the God who sent him. It happened to Jesus. I once literally burst through the doors of a large Assembly of God church while they were holding evening services. Without asking or seeking recognition, I cried out in my loudest voice the message of God to that body. The singing group who were conducting a concert fell silent as two ushers headed my direction. The pastor dashed to the front of the congregation and declared, Don't touch him. God spoke those words to me this morning, and I felt it was too strong a word, and I failed to deliver it. What he has spoken is from the Lord. The whole church fell to their knees and began seeking God, repenting and calling out in the fear of the Lord. Mark the difference between a people who walk humbly before the Lord and those of Malachi's day. Ask a righteous man a probing question about a spiritual offense, and his heart will melt and there will be a desire to repent and right the matter. Ask the same question to a hard-hearted religious diehard and observe him to take offense, watch him use rationalization, and then assume an attitude of resistance. Sealed unto his coming, 
page 291. Yahweh began his word through Malachi with, I have loved you, and ended with, Remember the law of Moses, my servant. His message was salted with, Return unto me, and I will return unto you. The nation had returned to their homeland, but had not returned unto their father. God's heart flowed outward to a people whose only concern was establishing their national identity, returning to former lifestyles, and to days of economic prosperity. In some respects, they had accomplished their goal. Now they were a nation out of civil bondage and on the verge of losing their spirit. They had become a state, a state which served as a protectorate to an established and wayward religious order. Is it not the same today? Grouping all the questions of priests and people as a unit. If one will group the fiats emanating from Israel's religious spirit as they pass by the several invitations of the Lord to know Him, a startling pattern emerges. The table of the Lord is contemptible. 1 verse 7 Jehovah, who hears the words of man's bedchamber, said the priests offered defiled food on his altar. It was defiled by their words. They began by despising his name, the I am that I am. Ministry disesteemed him. The table the Lord had set, see Song of Solomon chapter 2, was defined by them as contemptible. Later in Malachi, God declares that he has made them like the table of their offering, contemptible. God answered that it was only so because of their input. Listen, church, it is the same today. The table of the Lord's blessing is set with favor and honor and loving portions of his willful plenty. That banquet of supply, Philippians 4, verse 19, is only tainted by the sauce of twisted verbiage issued on a daily basis from the mouths of those who have not returned unto me. The table of the Lord is not contemptible. It is filled with that which nourishes the inner man and fills the person with life. Later in Malachi, the Lord declared that he will make the offering and the ministry which offers it the same. If the offering is contemptible, so will the ministry be manifested as contemptible. 2006 to 2007 will see this identity process come to pass. The table of the Lord is defiled. 1 verse 12 After the Lord issued a call for someone to stand in opposition to the standard practices of delivering ministry, the leader's answers are the same as before. God described a glorious table set for the Gentiles, and one where His name is great among nations. Their reply was, That table is defiled by Gentiles and the nations. National Israel still says the same nearly 2,500 years later. The problem, however, has multiplied and now has infiltrated Christendom. The table set by those of current religious dementia is not the table of God. Communion with its participants and service from its plates lead to distortion and disesteem. It is a profane table made so by a sneering multitude that survey the precious offerings of Calvary and declare, oh, what weariness! Declaring they have eclipsed the whole of history with new doctrines and new formulas, their goal is to segment the table into at least two parts, those who adhere to their schemes and those who do not. They push to the fringes those who seek to gather at God's table in order to substitute higher order menus filled with husks. Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. 2 verse 17 Observe the word delights and its root meanings. Old Testament Hebrew, shephets, a primitive root properly to incline to, by implication, literally but rarely to bend, like bowing in favor, figuratively to be pleased with, desire. King James Version, have take, delight, desire, favor, like, move, be pleased, have pleasure, will, 
would. Reversal of truth is easy to swallow when one is accustomed to eating at the wrong table. Thus this third relativity rolls outward from the teachings of those who have long since been addicted to the flavor of error. Malachi's third conclusion could have just as easily been based on current evaluative schemes applied to modern ministry. If a ministry has been declared outwardly successful and is filled with all the right ingredients from the table of the certified, then it is deemed good in the sight of the Lord, and He delights in them. Enter, duh, in the foyer. That which is devoid of the leading presence of the Spirit of God is evil when it has been dubbed His table. Those who smilingly greet all comers and usher them into that table stand to be judged alongside the leadership whom they serve. Ignorance is no excuse. The God of Malachi accepts no such rationale. To believe God takes pleasure and bows in respect to such defilement is disillusioned mockery. So now we call the proud blessed, for those who do wickedness are raised up. Yes, those who tempt God go free. 3 verse 15 Tempt, Old Testament, Bakan, a primitive root meaning to test, especially metals, generally and figuratively to investigate. King James Version, examine, prove, tempt, try or trial, not too far from one error is another. In answer to God's, your words have been harsh against me, and you have said, it is vain to serve God, what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, comes the opiated reply listed as number four. Today, a huge malaise permeates the air of most clergy, which in essence leads to this same false conclusion. Later in this treatise, one can view God's judgment. Number 5. Oh, what weariness! 1 verse 13. Although this verse precedes the 315 verse, it is strongly attached to it. Weariness in offering the evening and morning sacrifices garnered a response from God that might be construed as, Don't worry yourself then, I won't accept those offerings anyway. Eating at the wrong table takes its toll. Weariness is what comes of routine retinues and receding power. Does not the ministry of today stand in this judgment? The answer might well be heard today. Why bother? I won't accept your offerings anyway. God's reply. Just as the previous groupings reflect a corporate mind, so does the grouping of God's oracles reflect his strong judgment. Number 1. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. 1 verse 3. Number 2. They may build, but I will throw down. 1 verse 4. Number 3. I have no pleasure in you. 1 verse 10. Number 4. I will not accept an offering from your hands. 1 verse 10. Number 5. I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. I have cursed them already. 2 verse 2. Number 6. I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces. 2 verse 3. Number 7. I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people. 2 verse 9. Contemptible is the same word as used by the priests in describing God's altar. God has made them like their altar. Number 8. I will come near you for judgment. 3 verses 5 and 6. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, exploiters, and the unjust. Number 9. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. 3 verse 6. Within the nine replies are specific messages towards his people, whether priest or citizen, whether Jew or Gentile. To Israel, I have loved you, 1 verse 2. You shall say, The Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel, 1 verse 5. Magnified, Old Testament, Godal, a primitive root, 
properly to twist, compare. In, for example, to be, causatively make large, in various senses, as in body, mind, estate, or honor, also in pride. King James Version, advance, boast, bring up, exceed, excellent, be, become, do, give, make, wax, great, greater, come to, estate, bigger things, grow, grow up, increase, lift up, magnify, be much set by, nourish, pass, promote, proudly spoken, tower, to Gentiles and to the nations. My name shall be great among the Gentiles. 1 verse 11. I am a great king. My name is to be feared among the nations. 1 verse 14. To Edom they shall be called the territory of wickedness. 1 verse 4. Speaking to Edom. Territory, border, Old Testament, gabul, or shortened, gabul, from Old Testament properly accord as twisted, by implication a boundary, by extension the territory enclosed, King James Version, border, bound, coast, excrate, landmark, limit, quarter, space. The people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. 1 verse 4. Jordan's Mountains, Sons of Esau, Indignation, Old Testament, Zoam, a primitive root, properly to foam at the mouth, to be enraged, King James Version, Abhor, Abominable, Be Angry, Defy, Have Indignation. To the priests, when offering sacrifices for the people, should I accept this from your hand? 1 verse 13. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, 2 verse 8, corrupted, Old Testament, shachath, a primitive root, to decay, causatively ruin, literally or figuratively, King James Version, batter, cast off, corrupt, corrupter, corrupt thing, destroy, destroyer, destruction, lose, mar, perish, spill, spoiler, etc., waste, waster. To Judah, the first thing, profaned the Lord's holy. Some interject institution, while others use sanctuary. Without the interjections, the scripture implies all that God calls holy. 2 verse 11. Profaned, Old Testament, kalal, a primitive root, properly to bore, by implication to wound, to dissolve figuratively to profane a person, place, or thing, to break one's word, to begin as if by an opening wedge, to play the flute, King James Version, begin, men began, defile, break, defile, eat, as common things, first gather the grape thereof, take inheritance, pipe, player on instruments, pollute, cast as, profane, self, prostitute, slay, slain, sorrow, stain, wound. To Judah, the second thing, you cover the altar of the Lord with tears. 2 verse 13. Weeping is fine between the porch and the altar, but when one comes to the altar, tears cease. At the altar there is to be rejoicing for forgiveness, bright hope for tomorrow. To those that fear him, a book of remembrance was made before the Lord. 3 verse 16. The Lord listened and heard them. Book of remembrance was written. 3 verse 16. They shall be mine. 3 verse 17. I will make them my jewels. 3 verse 17. I will spare them. 3 verse 17. The Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. 4 verse 2. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. 4 verse 2 And you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this. 4 verse 3 I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. 4 verse 5 the two groups apart from the general population and the leadership. Group 1. Someone to shut the gates and stand against the crowds. 1 verse 10. While the priests in complete cooperation with the people were offering stolen, 
blind and lame offerings on the altar of sacrifice, which was to be a reflection of the coming perfect sacrifice, God called for someone to wake up and shut the gates. While the priests and people stand before God and cry out, Now we entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us, God calls for someone to shut the gate and their mouths. That someone should be strong enough to close the gates against all opposition and forbid altar fires to be kindled for an unholy offering. Oh, where is that someone today? Where is the someone who will stand in the foyer and forbid the crowds from entering so as not to offer one more unholy offering to God? Where is the someone who will stand in the office of priest and forbid his wayward brothers from further corrupting the people? Where is that someone? Group 2. Those who feared the Lord. 3 verse 16. Apart from priests and the general congregants stands a smaller grouping of those that feared the Lord. Oh, the contrast! See them as they converse with one another. They are known to each other by the Spirit. 3 verse 16 One might guess the topic of their conversation and their mutual encouragement while standing apart. This group has the ear of God. The Lord listened and heard. 3 verse 16 He wrote a book of remembrance recording those who meditate on his name he claims them as his he spares them from the impending judgment by them a witness and measuring scale is accomplished when a worldly church observes them they can ascertain who serves god and who does not serve god 3 verse 18 father or master Perhaps the question of one six is as important in these times as in Malachi's. God is still asking for the church to determine who he is to them. Am my father? Then where is my honor? Am my master? Then where is my respect? Deep in the heart of Malachi was the knowledge that God is a great king and that he changes not. Malachi knew this was not the case with most of those he addressed. Seemingly, the issue of Malachi was about corrupted offerings, but the theme is greater than that. Hovering over every word of this prophecy is the Lord seeking a holy people to make holy offerings to Him. Those who grasp chapter 3 for personal gain and make tithing a consternation and confusion do disservice to this momentous prophecy. Far from collection plates and offering envelopes is the cry of, If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you. 2 verse 2 Original Priesthood The Lord, in 2 verses 4 through 7, painted a picture of his original intention with Levi and the priesthood. Are not we priests? Are we exempt from this model? Then you will know that I have sent this commandment to you, those who fear him, that my covenant with Levi may continue. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and turned many away from iniquity. Then God laid out the leadership role for everyone in fivefold ministry. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. 2 verse 7 but those messengers corrupted the covenant of Levi. Corruption cannot stand in the presence of the Almighty. When the Lord uttered this phrase, immediately those not in the real covenant of Levi were changed to contemptible beings. Like vileness in Nahum, they became contemptible in their innermost being, and all that the people could see was their place before a defiled altar. 
God also pointed out to Judah the strong connection between one act of disobedience and its rippling influence. Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. 2 verse 11 The Lord contrasted the divorce of the wife of one's youth to the divorce of a people from God. As many of them had married foreign women and worshipped the Son as God, the Lord declared that by contrast the true Son of Righteousness would arise and there would be healing in His wings. Both priest and people had entered a liaison to tread lightly on applying the law. Their making divorce acceptable did not lessen its effect. God hates divorce. It covers one's garment with violence, therefore take heed to your spirit. 2 verse 16 Their actions spoke louder than their words. God said he was wearied with their words. He desired a holy people with a holy offspring. God's messenger of the covenant. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? These words were written to those who fear the Lord. From 3 verse 16 to the end of the book, every single word of prophecy is written to this group alone. The coming day of the Lord, the prophet Elijah, the son of righteousness with healing, the promise of provision, the power over the wicked, the law of Moses, the statutes and judgments, and the turning of hearts is written to God's jewels. If there is a striking of the earth with a curse, it will lie squarely upon the shoulders of that group. This concludes the study, duh, in the foyer, a commentary on Malachi, a PowerPoint study created by Gospel Outreach Association in cooperation with Oliver Evangelistic Association.